on behalf of the crew, thank you for including us in your travel plans. We wish you a warm welcome home, a good journey to your next destination. Thank you and have a great day. Welcome to Boston Logan International oh, that's Airport. A I gotta get my bag. Uh, we gotta get the uh, No, it's not. No, it's not. I got my bag. Let's go get the car. You're going the wrong way. Come on. Okay, so we're here in Boston. Actually, it's Cambridge. I just learned that those are two different cities today. Anyway, we're about to meet up with an architect, Hank Scholar. Not only does he design buildings, but he's a curator of sorts. Hank's apartment is filled with thousands of objects that he finds all around the city. These are his new found treasures, ones that other people have just thrown out. Hank's giving them a second life in his museum of unnecessary things. Here's Hank on episode one of Artist Proof. Riley! How are you? Oh, so good to see you again. You? Oh, and I should have mentioned, my name is Justin. And that other voice that you hear, that's our producer for this episode, Riley. From the moment that you walk into Hank's house, you're greeted by what he calls the robot. It looks like this combination of 1960s sci-fi meets hair salon with these mechanical arms that are like tentacles, but with hair dryers. There's a lot going on. Feels like it might hug you, feels like it might electrocute you. But it's nice. And it's kind of the perfect way to be greeted into uh, Hank's world. I found this outside of a hair salon. They were throwing it out. This was probably 20 some years ago. Yeah. And I didn't, you know, I didn't really know what it was for, but it, I mean, it just looked like a robot. And uh, <laughs> it's, a, you know, I think you sit underneath it and these lamps come on and there's a blower. And I think it has something to do with a. Uh, Getting a perm, maybe? Sure. There's this really kind of um, primitive computer thing on the back that um, swivels out. And uh, I don't know. I mean, like, when I moved into this place, this was the biggest place I'd lived in um, ever. So I had all this extra space. So I, I wasn't going to, like, leave things like that on the curb. I, right. I had room for it. So since then, I've, you know, I've collected almost everything I have. Or maybe 60% of what I have, I've found on the curb somewhere. Yeah. So I, I just, I'm a sort of a pathological picker-upper of stuff that I see <laughs> on, the, on the sidewalk. Um, it's a good hobby habit to have. Oh yeah, yeah, it's not New York, but it's, we do pretty well around here. Yeah. You know, any, any city that has a lot of turnover, like in, in density, like, you know, Boston and Cambridge, uh -huh. you're gonna find some good stuff out there. Yeah, yeah. You just I can't believe this is just sitting on the curb. Oh, I know, yeah. I'll show you. He I, looks I, like he wants to hug you. Doesn't he? <laughs> or, 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 or uh, you know, destroy. Right, I was going to say. Or destroy. Or that's yeah. fine. That's fine. It's up okay. to you. That says, says a lot about your, your, the way you look at life. Like, is uh, optimist or pessimist? Is, is he uh, friendly or is he threatening? I think he's uh, friendly. Yeah. I think he's trying to hug me. Yeah. Go like, when, he, when you walk in the door, he's like, oh, well done. Just plug it in, hug yeah. it, see what, see, what, mm. see what goes down. Yeah. Then, then threatening, maybe. It is threatening when you plug it in. That's why I, I sort of like That's it. Yeah, yeah. I put a bunch of tape over it. I didn't want anybody plugging that in because I did plug it in once and like the lights started to down. <laughs> you, you, you found it when my grandpa was still, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I remember because he, he was telling us, or he told my mom, and she's like, well, Hank brought home the robot. Yeah, it's in this book. I'll show you this. It, it was published in this book. Of, uh, yeah. Of, of, of mm -hmm. odd things that people have. So Hank's apartment is on the second floor of a 19th century town hall, perfectly situated at the beginning of Antrim Street, one of the longest residential streets in the Boston area. This beautiful, quintessential place is like the one that you would see on a postcard. It also happens to be the family home of our producer. Her grandparents used to live here and were pretty close with Hank. That's how we found him. When you think of Boston, when you think of Cambridge, Antrim Street, that's the picture in your head. It's this house. It's that feel that you already know before you even get there. It's kind of like Hank. So, it's yeah, the intersection is, uh, of old over the years it's and new. A, like it's a museum. It's a, I've made it to my own like museum, sure. uh, which we all do to some extent. Everybody's their own curator, and I just uh, took that to heart. And um, you know, because I had the room, uh, I you know never let you know I. I took everything, you know, grabbed everything I could off the sidewalk or like my grandparents when they were 
uh, emptying their house, I got all these cool things like the grandfather clock, uh, this this thing here, um, stuff that uh, I happen to have brothers that don't really care about stuff like that or like this. <laughs> yeah. So I kind of benefit from that. I, I get all the cool stuff that my parents or my grandparents uh, were getting rid of. It's paid off in very, <laughs> very cool ways. Nice. Yeah, there'll be little, there's little cat things it's lying around. But then as you, yeah. as your, your friends get familiar with how you live, they like, they wind up buying you things because they sure. see something like, oh my God, I, you would probably love this. And so I get all kinds of crazy things from my friends that, um, uh, you know, I'm always touched by, but they, you know, without really knowing anything about my taste, they kind of know my taste and they sure. can, um, you know, they always surprise me with like the, the crazy, you know, if they see something crazy, but funny, they'll just grab it for me and it, it'll wind up here at some point. This was always That's my good. favorite thing to do. When I was visiting downstairs, I would always have to come upstairs. Yeah. Just like, as we make our way through the apartment, we're taken aback by just how eclectic his collection is. Every inch is this colorful explosion of happy accidents that have somehow fallen into his lap. Other people's trash are now his museum highlights. It's whatever happens. We live in major cities. Yeah, oh, it's whatever happens. So I let, I let the stuff happen to me. Like, I, I, don't, I never seek things out, like, unless I'm going to a store to buy something. It's, uh, I just, like, let, let it fall onto me, and uh, I'll, I'll make something out of it. So, yeah, I mean, almost, you know, there's a, a huge percentage of the stuff that you see around here just kind of fell into my lap. And, you know, maybe it's because of my particular mindset that I, I saw something there um, that other people walked right by for some reason and I didn't um, so I yeah I and I just love walking the sidewalks and especially certain times of year when people are just divesting themselves of things they're moving like September is always a good time right around Labor Day if, that's when all the, a lot of the apartments turn over and people just like you know these you know houses just kind of vomit up stuff. Um, and there's, you know, yard sales throughout the summer. I always go the next day when the, the stuff is there for free. You know, it's always the stuff that nobody wanted to buy sure. that I find has the most potential and maybe the most, you know, the most interest to me. You see so many people's, you see so many apartments or houses that look like they were outfitted from like Design Within Reach or Crate and Barrel and not a lot of personality. Like I, um, I, and I, I do think that your abode should be as clear a reflection of your personality as possible. Like I, I would like for people to walk in here and kind of get me. Like I, you know, we talk, we're talking a lot about the psyche. Uh, like I, I kind of would like people that come in here to look around and tell me something about myself. Because to me, that's like, it's like cheap therapy. You know, I think if you're as open about yourself as you can be in how you present your world to people, it's an invitation for them to kind of intuit something from it that that maybe you didn't even, maybe I didn't even know. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of I'm kind of looking for people to help me figure myself out by opening myself up as, as much as I am. But a big part of that is the, you know, the collecting and the displaying of books and music, because that's that's what I always look for when I go into somebody's house. Um, they can kind of um, present themselves in the manner that they want to, but there's no hiding. When you see like the stack of CDs or records or books, that's that's the real them right there. I kind of feel like I know more about them from you know this little pile of CDs than I did from all of the, this whole room full of furniture, because it's almost like you you know you can't like. You can't decide how you're going to laugh. It's just, it just happens to be how you laugh. You can't control that. And so I don't think you can really even control your, your, your cultural tastes. You can hide them if you want. You can stash them somewhere. You don't have to display them. But once you see them, I think you've, get, uh, you've got a glimpse into somebody that you'll never get from, or you generally won't get from like how they you know, furnish their apartment or even maybe some of the artwork that they, that they choose. So I try to... like I. It really bothers me in one way to see people dumping their CD collections on the sidewalk. But then again, I get a lot of I get a lot of good stuff that way too. Um, I mean, I've got the room for it, so I mean, like this is I, I this is my favorite little unveiling here. 
So that's the, kind of just where it starts. <laughs> um, did you, I think you used the word little on your way over here. Right that's in the middle of Hank's dining room is this perfectly normal closet that's filled with all of these CD jewel cases. All of the music that makes Hank who he is. He doesn't stream songs. He needs that tangible item. He needs that clarity of the music to put that CD in the CD player, to put that record on the record player, to hold it in his hand. So you start to get a feel for where Hank pulls his inspiration from. Just looking at the album titles and the artists, it sends you back to this era from when he was a kid, when he first started getting acquainted with his creative sparks. Um, your parents would take you to open houses, mm -hmm. basically for entertainment. Yeah, yeah. My, it was my mom who, it was kind of her hobby. She was really into seeing what other people's houses were like. So, uh, and we um, we were in the process of moving from one house to another in the same city in Dearborn, just, you know, going from a busy intersection to a less busy intersection. I have two brothers and, you know, we needed like a lot of yard and a lot of space to, to run around. So, so my mom started to um, go to these open houses just to see what other houses were on the market in the same city. And I would generally tag along with her. These would be on the weekends, usually on a Saturday. And uh, and I was really just fascinated because I, I also really loved seeing how other people lived. And I loved seeing all these because we were looking at bigger houses th than the one we had we were currently living in. And and just all I was just fascinated by all these little nooks and crannies and how I don't know. Houses tend to look the same from the outside, but once you get inside, they're really kind of different. There's way, the layouts are much different than you might expect. Sometimes you find a basement that has a basement. It's, you know, just kind of weird little juxtapositions and odd little layouts that um, really kind of um, just really interested me. And I think that's kind of what led me to want to become an architect. That was, I, I never really, I didn't grow up like being fascinated by buildings, but I was fascinated by looking at other people's houses. And we also grew up in a pretty interesting house itself. I mean, it was an old farmhouse um, in a in Dearborn, which is a suburb of Detroit, and it was a, it was in a, again, a kind of near a busy intersection. So it wasn't like on a farm, but it was kind of a built as a farmhouse at one point in time. And it, it had, um, all kinds of little nooks and crannies. It had closets, it had closets, it had, you know, every stair had like a little space under the stair that you could make into a little kind of hideaway. Um, we had like a boiler room that was sort of like a, a furnace in the round that you could kind of like sneak around, all kinds of, you know, just little oddball spaces. And I've kind of grown up being attracted to like the you know, like quirkiness and things that are a little bit out of the ordinary. And I think that probably it maybe has a lot to do with why, you know, my environment looks the way it does. I like, I really like quirk. I like, um, I like things that don't really seem to have a reason to be, but, but they kind of fill you with joy or, uh, mirth. Um, just, uh, you know, I, I, I like things that, that just you have to, that you don't get right away, that you have to kind of work at to figure out why this thing came into being. Um, that monkey, for instance, like well, who, who made that? Why would somebody make something like that? I mean, I, I'm constantly finding things that like that, that somebody made that I, I can't let I can't let go because, uh, uh you know, just the reason that just because they exist, that's that's enough for me. But I I just love the fact that somebody went through the effort of making that monkey. Um, OK, you know. so I feel like I should explain what Hank is talking about here. Um, the monkey that he keeps referring to is this statue. Um, I think I think it's a statue. It, sure, it's a statue, but it's on the wall and it's a it's a ceramic monkey with um, deer antlers coming out of the top of its head while wearing a nightcap um, like that you, you know, would sleep in. Uh, well, not me, but, you know, some people maybe. And it's on the wall uh, attached to a, um, a log, a, a, a giant piece of wood from a tree. That is the monkey. Somebody made it. Hank loved it. And, and I think that's probably the, true for most of the stuff I have in my house here. Um, it was just something that caught my eye. They seem to really have no reason to, to exist, um, but, you know, put us, but made me smile all the same. 
Right. Well, this is my. This is one of the rare times I tried to be a collector. So I, I found a big boy figurine. So I said, okay, I'm going to look out for these things. And every time I see one, I'm going to get them. And I imagined I would have this amazing collection of big boy figurines. It stopped at five. <laughs> and then there's a couple Michelin men. So I was going to I was going to start collecting Michelin men, and I only got two. So. Uh, I do, every now and then I get on a little kick and I think, okay, I'm going to make this like a thing. And it just like, it never lasts. And I think it's because I, I don't have it in me to seek things out. And I have a, I do have a rule that um, if I'm going to get stuff like that, I'm going to go to like an antique store or thrift store. I'm, I'm not going to just go on eBay. It's just too easy to buy things on eBay. So my, I, I've only ever bought one thing on eBay and that's, that's this thing right here. And uh, I'd like to see if people can guess who that is. It's okay. So this went on for a while. So it's, uh, all three of us stood there trying to decipher the plaster mask that he bought on eBay that's now stuck to his wall. Who is it? A fairly famous actor, although his heyday was certainly before you were born. In all of Hank's house, he bought one thing on eBay, and it was Henry Winkler's face. Because of course it was. So how did you get to architecture? Tulane was um, a, a great school for me to be at from, uh, from an architectural standpoint, but I think the bigger part of my education there was just being in New Orleans, um, especially coming from the Midwest, from you know from a suburb of Detroit. You couldn't probably pick a much different place in this country from where I was from than than New Orleans. And New Orleans again is you know, it's also a kind of a quirk capital. It's full of eccentric characters um, that you would encounter on a daily basis. And, it, and it's full of like really odd traditions and, um, and, and things like that. And it really, um, it, it was, it was a whole little a whole new world to me. And also, it also felt so archaic in some sense. I mean, this was, you know, in the mid eighties, you would go into, a, you could go into a bank, a branch bank, there would be no bulletproof glass separating you and the teller. They generally would log in the, the transaction in a ledger book. It was just, it, it just seemed out of time. Um, and that also um, appealed a great deal to me. So I, I think that, you know, just being in New Orleans for the few years that I, that I was, um, had a pretty big impact on how I look at the world and probably how I create my own art. Um, as much as the, the actual program at the, at, at Tulane University did. So as we transition from room to room, there's this repeating theme that stands out. Hank's collection embodies the 1960s and 70s. Sure, not everything he owns is from that time, but thematically, you can see the lens through which he curates his space. Its color, its texture, its actual things from those decades. Even the rooms themselves feel a bit like you're stepping back into this eccentric version of that era. Where do you feel at home the most in your home? Yeah, it. Uh, I think it's uh, varies by season. Like in the winter, I'm in this little side room here. It's uh, it's it's a den essentially. I call it. Uh, I've I've always called it the makeout room. In fact, I I did have I had like a beaded curtain over the door at one point. It just it was again. It's like a room that I had. You know, I I live here alone. I've got my bedroom, the, the kitchen, the living room, the dining room. Then there's a room that uh, I use now as an office. I didn't always use it as an office, but uh, it was sort of that type of room where I could I could do work, and then there was this room here, this this other room, which because it didn't really have any, uh, any a reason uh, for being, I just started calling it the makeout room, and because I, I have and I also had like a little I've got a day bed in there. And in fact, at one point, all I had in there was like a little day bed, and you know, and this kind of groovy lamp. So it, it, probably people thought that's the function of the room anyway. So I played that up. I, I tried to make it like a little kind of bachelor pad space i got you know a beaded curtain open and put that in the doorway i you know i bought all kinds of tiki lights and things i was trying to recreate uh you know uh the the kind of 60s era bachelor pad that i recall when i you know i was i grew up in the i was born in the early 60s or mid 60s and so um i i have a vague memory of of like 60s decor and um and Certainly, that spilled over into the '70s, but I was trying to recreate in a kitschy way, you know, what I recall being seen as like the the cool kind of party den um, when the, from when I was growing up. I had a pretty good childhood. I, you know, I would, I know that people 
have struggles when they grow up, and I, I'm sure I did. But I, my my general recollection of my upbringing and my childhood environment was is pretty idyllic. I, uh, you know, there's a magic in childhood. We did, I don't know, maybe like I know that it's kind of a cliche that we spend eighty percent of our adult life trying to like recapture the magic of our of, of childhood, and maybe in a sense I'm. Um, I'm trying to do that. One of the more vivid memories I remember having from growing up would be when my parents would have uh, these dinner parties, and they were, they were more like cocktail parties. And these this would have been like in the late '60s. It was generally my dad's cohort from work, and my brothers and I would be sitting up at the top of the stairs, kind of like you know, peeking down and spying on the the, the festivities. And you know, my parents were you know, typical, you know, parents, they didn't really um, let it all hang out that often, but they would have these pretty good parties. And I remember looking, peering down through like a wall of cigarette smoke. And it was, it seemed like it was like this wall of like, it was like, all I saw was, all I remember seeing was like orange, like there were orange lights and there were orange glasses. And you'd see like, like shiny teeth, like people's teeth shining through the smoke and you hear glasses clinking and people laughing and, you know, you know, limes floating in, 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 in glasses. And it was like, it was like this sort of magical environment that I, um, there must be a reason that that's one of my more in, indelible memories from that time. And that, that I, all I remember is like seeing orange and, and, and seeing teeth and, and hearing laughter. And I think that probably is why I, the color orange is so, so important to me. I think, I, I don't know, I think I, I may be um, more inspired by color than anything else. Like there's something about color and certain colors. Like, that makes sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, so uh, I like if I'm just thumbing through uh, a magazine or nowadays if I'm just if I'm scrolling through like an Instagram feed, uh, a design Instagram feed, the things that stop me that I'll just like stop on. Generally, it's the first thing I'll notice is the color, um, and if it's if there's something if if there's like orange or a certain type of green, or just like something with like a black and white pattern, those are the things that jump out to me the most. Like if I just you know glimpsed at something. Before I noticed the massing, before I noticed even like the architectural style, the scale, the proportion, I think I noticed the color first, um, and uh, and then I then I work my way to <clears throat> the rest of you know what it is, and but it, sometimes the color alone can kind of sell me on something. So you may like orange is kind of my it, it's sort of my color um, if that is a color, uh, and it, that's like. The thing you, know, you talk about stopping somebody dead in their tracks. If I'm walking on the street and I see, uh, you know, I, you know, if I'm putting on my glasses on, things are sort of blurry up in the distance. But if I see a bunch of a pile of stuff on the sidewalk and something is orange, then I just I I, I walk towards it immediately just to see what it what's all about because that's the thing that tra- kind of draws me in. Because if I see something orange, I tend to think that there's something uh, space age there. Maybe there's something um 70s ish there's maybe something sort of retro the, the orange to me is a lot of those things and it's also sort of the color of optimism it's it, it it's um it, it's just one of those things that will always um speak to me optimism that is the perfect word for hank the more time that we spend with him in his apartment in this place that is just teeming with optimism the more optimistic we become, the happier we become. And that's kind of the point of all of this, of this place that he's curated. Sitting around talking about creative ideas, being surrounded by all of these weird and strange and unique trinkets, trying to figure out where the hell the cat is that I saw when I walked in. I know there's a cat. My allergies tell me there's a cat here somewhere. But it's all just boosting our optimism our happiness. And that's kind of Hank's MO. It's who he is. It's a reflection of him and what he's curated in this museum of unnecessary things. Well, they, they, uh, they chuckle. There's a lot of laughter, which I like. I mean, I love, I love, I like making people laugh for one thing. And I like it when my space can make people laugh. Like it's disarming. I think it really disarms people, but it puts them like, you can't like, you couldn't, 
come in here to have a serious conversation and then still like have that mindset once you walked in. It just it just doesn't happen. Um, but also, I love just when people walk in for the first time. They're if you ever taken a cat to a new space, like they just run around and they have to see everything and like because they, they want to like absorb the entirety of their new surroundings as fast as they can. And I think people they tend to be like that when they walk in here. They're always kind of like you know gravitating from one thing to another really quickly. And it's like wait, there's no, there's more. Wait, there's more. Wait, there's more. Um, and there is more, a lot more. Hank's mind it doesn't stop. When he hits a wall, he manages to find other outlets for his creativity. Sure, he designs buildings, yes, and he collects weird stuff for sure. But he's also an animator, among other things. Spending time with him is like spending time in art therapy. His space speaks to you. His theories on why and how he does what it is that he does, they've got us clinging on every word. And we barely scratch the surface of who he is as an artist and creator. Good ideas you see you know like these these bad drawings um so like i you, you probably over the course of your career you maybe hear like three or four things that stick with you these little sayings or phrases and the first job i had um my first boss and i remember him telling me that to him design was nothing more than the elimination of bad ideas and it always stuck with me and it may, i don't know if he coined that or if he got it from somebody else but it seemed to make sense that like the, the 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 more you can exercise like bad ideas, the more room you create for good ideas. But for me, the good ideas tend to come from the bad ideas. Like when um, when I took the architectural registration exam, it's a one of the, one of the segments of the exam is you have four hours to design a little building. They give you the site, they give you the program. They give you the, the blocks of spaces that you need to incorporate, and then they give you a list of um, requirements. This room has to be next to that room. The main entrance has to be off of this street. Uh, this room cannot have southern exposure, etc. cetera. This is like just a laundry list of things that you have to satisfy. <clears throat> and the, you you can download a practice version of the test, and you, you're basically just like dragging and dropping um, rooms uh, and locating them, playing with the aspect ratios, and then you're, you're generating kind of a, a diagram of a of a, of a finished building. And so I used to make a game of it when I was studying. <clears throat> what's the worst building I could make that would still pass? Like, what's the worst thing I could do and still satisfy these twenty requirements? And it was a lot. It was really fun. It got it got you fluent at the software. But then, like, I started to realize that, wait, this isn't, this is really not a bad building at all. I mean, I tried to do something bad and I could actually see making it work. So that's, that, I, um, that sort of became my MO when I would start a project to just to loosen up and just, just try to be bad and just for the sake of being bad. And, you know, rarely does something come out of that, but I'm surprised at how often there is some, I find something that I would not have otherwise encountered because, you know, I was trying to be good before, and now I'm trying to be bad. So that's kind of a brief synopsis of how I tend tend to, you know, <clears throat> generate some of my ideas. If I ever feel stifled or boxed yeah. in on a, a an architectural thing I'm doing, it's easy. It's easy. I, I I tend to just put that aside and jump into the world of animation because that's so much more immediate and it's a different part of the brain, I guess. And, and I, I, so I give myself an, uh, it's always a little challenge. I'll give myself an hour. Okay. I'm going to take an hour away from what I'm doing here and I'm going to give myself an hour to create something just from scratch. I'll just, whatever the first photograph I see on the tourist Instagram feed, I'm just going to do a screen. I'll grab that screenshot, make that the, the basis, and then I'll insert something. And, and I, I, I don't know what I don't know what I'm going to do, but I give myself an hour and then, the hour is gone and I've got something and um, it fills me with confidence. And again, it's like the best use of, it's the best hour I can spend. Like I can't do anything better in one hour, I think, than a lot of those animations. It's just, you know, that in terms of like the use value, the 
the um, the level of inter- how interesting they are, how you know how much somebody else might enjoy them. Uh, there's not much else I can do in an hour that would that would be a better use of that time. It, it comes out very natural. Yeah, like I said, like I that's why like I I I like being like opening myself up to to other people. Like I like you know that's why I like having people come over to my apartment and and judge for themselves what it is they're looking at because they can they'll turn to me and say well you're this kind of person like it helps me like because i'm not exactly sure who i am you know to be honest and i i I joke about it's cheap therapy for somebody to come over look at my place and and start to make some uh come to some conclusions about what type of person i am because that maybe helps me figure out what kind of person I am. But like I, you know, I never considered like the term maximalism. I never even thought about that word until like that apartment therapy uh, article. And like, the headline was uh, Hank's Minimalist Maximalist Museum in, in Cambridge. And I never thought about that. I'm like, that's right. I, I, I am, a, I guess if some people are minimalist, I'm kind of a maximalist. I, I like stuff. I want to be surrounded by stuff. I don't want to declutter i mean I, my house isn't cluttered it's very orderly but it's packed full of stuff and i like to be surrounded by the stuff of life and uh the stuff of my life and um that i think that makes me kind of a, a maximalist uh i i i'm not really you know i don't want to live in a in a you know, space with clean white walls and i just i, I this stuff has to be somewhere i want it to be around me talking to me all the time and being part of, you know, a character in my life. Hey, cool, we did it. That was the first episode of the show. Nobody else is here. I'm talking to myself, but it's still very cool. If you like this episode and you're curious to dive into more of Hank Scholar's world, you can subscribe to our Patreon for more of the conversation and see a gallery of Hank's maximalist collection. Check it out, artistproofofficial.com. On our next episode, we're going to take a road trip. We're going to get some snacks, and we're going to drive west towards the setting sun of Massachusetts. About three hours outside of Boston, there's an area known as the Berkshires. That's where Hank has gone all architecty, which I think is a word, at least it is now, in the town of North Adams, with his design of the hotel tourist. This maximalist went all minimalist for a peaceful retreat in our next episode. If every building has a personality, the personality of something that's really slick and over-designed is simply off-putting to a lot of people. It's just like, it's like a person that you don't want to be cornered with at a party. Um, and I try to find a way in everything I do, and especially in building design, I would like for my own personality to come through, that um, somehow people know me better after seeing my work or experiencing my work. Check it out wherever you get your podcasts. Today's episode was produced by myself, Justin Key, and Riley Walker. The music was provided by Soundstrike. Artist Proof is a production of Wilder Media 